So we have uh, two, two and a half minutes. Oh, yeah, we are waiting. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, right. yes. Well, we're, we're going to wait for two and a half minutes, you know, because yeah. we're supposed to start at uh, five GMT. Yeah. So it's uh, it's exactly two minutes now from okay from start off. Yeah. Thanks for your patience, sir. Oh, Wale, Wale. Um, okay, I wanted to. Oh, sorry, okay. okay. I was taking Not a, I was taking a call. Okay, now I just wanted to uh, maybe, I don't know if I do it or you remind people to mute themselves until it's time for people to be called in. Okay, okay. I'll do that. So, so if you can tell people to, yeah, to be you. mute. Okay. I'll do, I'll do that. Sorry, uh, Doc and yeah. Prof. Even though I'm at an event, I'm actually muting people as they come in. So I'll, I'll be helping to do that. I mean, Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you, sir. Can you hear me okay? Okay. O okay. Diego, Diego, you are there? Diego? Yes, yes, sir, I'm here. You know, I'm, I, I'm you can hear also me. at an event, but I can hear you and I'm muting people. Okay. Okay. I want to be sure that okay is okay can hear me I want to start off. But well, it's like it's not that's some static from his end. I can hear you. I can hear you. I was I was given okay. a thumbs up that okay. I can hear you. I was okay. muted. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now um ladies and gentlemen, um I want to welcome you to the next in the series of our Dialogue with veteran writers. And um, the last encounter we have was, was with the Nobel laureate, uh, Professor Walisho Inka. Um, it was a very exciting moment. We all uh, learned from his uh, uh, wealth of uh, experience. Today, we are going on to another very important uh, 
elder among our writing writers uh, tribe. And uh, is uh, when I and when I announced that he will be coming today, the announcement has generated a lot of uh, excitement. So much so that people started flocking to the platform almost an hour before the event. And uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome our Professor Ngugi Wationgo. Um, and uh, as has been advertised, uh, we have another very important and uh, well acclaimed author to help us to interrogate him. And uh, that's uh, Professor O.K. Ndibe. Uh, like we did last time, we're going to allow uh, audience participation. But for the first uh, 40 minutes, uh, there will be a conversation between uh, O.K. and Professor uh, Wationgo. And um, all those who have questions or suggestions or interventions should keep their notes and allow the 40 minutes to lapse before we go into the audience participation. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you and uh, I hand you over to uh, Professor Kendi. Thank you. Okay, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wale uh, yeah. Okedira, a dear friend uh, of many, many years. Um, so when you invited me to uh, moderate this conversation with a man that I call Mwalimu, uh, because he's been my teacher, uh, uh, not formally in the classroom, but he's been my teacher uh, very much from my secondary school days when I first encountered uh, his, his books. Um, so we're going to get into that in a minute. But uh, it's a very short uh, conversation. We have only an hour and 30 minutes uh, total. And um, as you can imagine, there is so much ground that we must cover. So um, usually uh, people say that um, somebody needs no introduction, uh, but they go ahead and introduce this person at uh, extreme length. Uh, but today I'm going to say that anybody who has um, logged in today knows who Ngugi, uh, who is actually, I believe that the name is pronounced Gugi, that the N is silent. So Gugi Watyongo. Um, so everybody who is uh, logging in knows who Gugi Watyongo is. So I'm not going to introduce him. Um, if you want uh, quick biographical uh, snippets of him, uh, please Google uh, his name, but I'm not going to uh, spend uh, time introducing somebody who is one of the luminaries, great luminaries of global literature, not just African literature. Um, so uh, it's my delight to welcome somebody who has done me the honor indeed of uh, calling me not only a friend, but indeed he calls me one of his children, and it's an honor to welcome you, uh, Mwalimu Gugi Wationgo. Please, could you um, unmute yourself? <coughs> thank you very much. Wonderful. Yeah. So, thank you very much and welcome, uh, Mwalimu. I'm going to uh, begin by inviting you to uh, do something that we did in, at the Ake Festival in Nigeria, which was really magical, but it was more elaborate at Ake because what happened was that uh, your short story was translated instantly uh, at the conference into, I believe, 12 or so languages. And so um, different uh, translators took turns reading the same paragraph in their individual languages. But today I'm going to invite you to begin by reading um, a, a paragraph from your latest book, The Perfect Nine in English, uh, but to begin by giving us a taste of the Gikuyu uh, um, uh, version of the language, which was the original language in which you wrote it, and then to read the same paragraph in English. So please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's really great to be with you uh, all. 
I see some friends uh, here, or rather, they are zoomly here. <laughs> <laughs> zoomly here. <laughs> zoomly here. Yeah. yeah, and good to see uh, mm -hmm. all of you, and also for the invitation to participate in um, this uh, uh, organized by power. Because power speaks for itself. Power is power. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. So, very quickly, um, I'm going. To, I think I do it the other way around. I'll read it in English first. So when I read the Koyo, people can, huh, they know what I'm um, more or less they have an idea. Um, what is it I am saying in the Koyo? Yeah. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, the perfect nine or Kedamo Yuru in Gikuyo is uh, the myth of, of origins of Gikuyo people of Kenya. Yeah. Please note, I call them Gikuyo people of Kenya, not Gikuyo, whatever <laughs> uh, <laughs> colonialist scholars, yeah, as African peoples. Yeah. Okay. So um, now, the original myth is that the Koyo, the man, and the Mombi, the mother, huh? uh, where God stood them on Mount Kenya and showed them all the land. Huh? Yeah. Later, uh, and they have nine, ten daughters. Okay. Uh, they have no brothers. Uh, when they reach marriageable age, God goes back to the mountain and asks for, uh, for handsome young men, suitors, okay. Uh, and indeed the following day, when they wake up, there are nine handsome young men uh, standing outside. Now, I took problems. One, <clears throat> or I, I added two variations. I was intrigued by the question, really. You know, where did the nine or ten men come from? I know the Koyo people don't say, I did this. Oh, I did this. You know, I'm so, they say, God made me. Yeah? <laughs> You arrive at a place safely, you say, God <laughs> made you arrive at that place safely, right? Yeah. So even if they had come from elsewhere, they would still say, God placed them on the mountain and showed them all the land. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so me, I visualize then the, the uh, nine or ten suitors are the ten uh, remaining after so many suitors come to ask for their hand. Mm -hmm. Right? So I see them coming from all over the continent, the suitors, after hearing the beauty of these ten ladies. Yeah. But they are given a task to go back to Mount Kenya, climb it. Right? and bring back hair that cures all. This is because the last girl, the 10th girl is actually has weak legs, crippled legs, he can't go with them. But the young men, 99 of them, and the 10 girls, nine girls go together. The idea is they bring back that hair that cures all, and the hair grows in the middle of the tongue of a man eating over, okay? That's the challenge they have. So I see the nine as the last remaining of the 99, who some of them could not meet the challenges of the mount, the gentle mountains and back, okay? Yeah, um, that's the background. Uh, I want to read to you the, uh, I'll start with a section where, oh my God, yeah, yeah. 
Sorry about that, I had in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. You know, so I see the original father and mother, the coin mom, as coming from elsewhere into the mountain. And when they reach there, they are completely overwhelmed. They go on to Kenya and they are completely overwhelmed by the landscape. And they knew this is where God wants them to settle. Okay. Um, the Mount, the Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro were called mountains of the moon because of the permanent snow on the mountain. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, on top of the mountain, the landscape was beautiful. For a moment, Giko and Mombi were at a loss for words to describe the undulating plain that spread out before them, or the hills and valleys that edged them in, or the river that flowed through the green lilies. <laughs> Counselor, there is a <laughs> techno spark, okay. Countless animals of different shapes and colors. Hold for a moment. Uh, please, techno spark, could you, could you mute yourself? Who, me? No, techno spark. The, the person who is techno spark should mute. I think I think that's a problem we have. Uh, um, uh, could Wale, yeah, you should mute. Could. Otherwise, if the mic is open, okay. Please yeah. mute yourself. Yes. Could you All mute right. everybody else? Okay, I'll move okay. them. I'll them. Please. I continue. Okay. Uh, Mwalimu, I can't hear you. I wasn't hearing you. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I think you are yeah, muted. You well, are muted. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. So let's go back to the mountains. Let me see all this beauty and this scoop some of the moon or some of the snow or the moon and this scatter. Um, uh, they say, uh, you know what they are, the landscape was beautiful. For a moment, they were at a loss for words to describe the undulating plain that spread out before them, or the hills and valleys that hedged them in, or the rivers that flowed through the green lilies and reeds. Countless animals of different shapes and colors, bent low over the waters, drinking and lowing and grunting and roaring in the light. Others strutted about the banks or simply basked in the sun. Ku and Mombi turned to each other and murmured something. They were captives of to their wonder. And suddenly they felt 
their souls star and soar with joy. They record other places they have journeyed through. Some of them with mountains and woodlands like these, rivers like these, animals like these, but their hearts had not been drawn to them. And now, all the beauty they had left behind has reappeared tenfold for them. More gratitude than you were screaming, well up inside. And they broke into a song of praise. Owner of ostrich whiteness, we praise you. That one I'll sing in a coil. <laughs> version, yeah. <laughs> The co version uh, is again, they come and find uh, the land uh, so beautiful. Uh, and they, as I said, they get a bit of the moonlight and praise to God. Na ore moe makiwa goro shia tu ma mari di kana. Korea mana gera kodo kwa ire ma na joe taishi nyamo taishi na goti amabu shiriye nio doa madena ma andro na mobere na reu oda kamati gire no one ka oire na ogaitela igaire agai makina we broa gado dikelo. Mwene nyaga neto wako gada Nyo da koyo wakenga take Teri oyo joe na ye manyinge O na nyamo melemba minge Maho wa maya niri waku Mete na nyamo hamwe na nyoni Na shugoyo joe ne nani ya ine she will be sure there, the lady waku. Twa di kereria, twa mogambo. Wakunga yo, kigo da koyo de. Wa twa dira, tora matavega. Kero leroa, ridi waku moega. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mwalimu, for giving us um, what I call a symphony of languages. Mm. Um, so what I want to do today is to sort of bring you out. A lot of people have read your books and, and know you as a distinguished author, as a teacher, mm. as um, uh, uh, a critic, a theorist, and so on and so forth. But I want us to go back to the very beginning. There's this storied conversation, uh, encounter that you have with uh, Chinua Achebe at Makarere, uh, mm. at a gathering of African writers. But I want you to actually go back further to that moment, which you've told me about uh, at least on two occasions, when you lied about being a writer. And I believe that that's the moment when you are writing career. And I have a similar story, which I shared with you. So could you tell that story to the audience of when you were a student at my career? Let's share the stories. Yes. <laughs> Great minds think alike. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you see. Uh, anyway, what happened was this awesome. I, Joined my career in 19, I think it was July 1959. And, and I, in the English department, and there were writers then, uh, for student writers, writing for the uh, magazine of the Department of English called Pen Point. Yeah. And I was amazed that students can write and get published. Uh, now, one of the writers whom I really admired and one of the editors was a Kenyan called Jonathan Carriera, uh, in the late Jonathan Carriera uh, now. But he, so remember, I'm a first year and he's a senior. 
and he's a writer and he's published a magazine. So I meet him on the corridors uh, and, I, and I'm lost for words eh? because I want to talk to him, but no words will come out. Eh? So I said, Mr. Carriera, I have written a short story. Would you like to look at it? And he said, yes. <laughs> yeah. And actually, do you have it now? <laughs> OK. I said, oh, uh, uh, no, I, I, I'll bring it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The fact was, I had not written the story. I'd been thinking about it, but not writing it. And that was how that night I sat down and wrote my first story uh, called Mogumo or the Fig Tree, later published in my short story collections, Secret Lives and Minutes of uh, Glory. But that moment has always, is, is a very important part of my life, you know, yeah. I remember it very clearly. I can see Mr. Carriera. I can see how the encounter uh, with him and so on. So it was, yeah. I've told this story actually in my memoir, uh, Birth of a Dream Weaver. All right. Yeah. My, which is the story of how I became a writer. And my career was very, very important to me. Yeah. That's when I, when I see all the, <laughs> Uh, Ugandans who are listening, uh, like Dan Kahiana and the others, you know, I, I always feel they are, <laughs> Ugandans are my special brothers and sisters, yeah, uh, because it was in Uganda, Makerere, that I realized myself as a writer. Thank you very much. So your first book that I read was uh, The River Between. And many years, all these years later, as a, I read it as a secondary school student uh, back in Nigeria, the opening lines, the two ridges lay side by side. One was Kamerno, the <laughs> other was Makunya, Makunya or something. Well, yeah. Between them was a valley. There is something beautiful, irresistible, enchanting about that writing. I want you to give us a sense of what brought you to that moment when you were able to write those beautiful, evocative lines. Um, and I want you to speak about perhaps both your traditional uh, formation in uh, Gikuyu, uh, law and legend and traditions, and also you are training uh, in uh, the literatures uh, of the world at Makarere. Now, uh, actually, that, first of all, let me just explain for the would-be writers, uh, and the, motiv the motivation for writing the novel that we were between was absolutely monetary. <laughs> <laughs> Our allowances at Makere were really very, very small as students. When they were on scholarship, but the actual pocket money given was so minuscule, so to speak. And now comes a competition organized by East African Literature Bureau, uh, a novel writing competition. And the amount of money was a thousand shillings. Oh my God. Good, a thousand shillings, which by the today's value is five dollars. <laughs> but it was a lot of money. So um, a friend of mine, uh, uh, you know, told us me that we should enter this competition. It was a lot of money to let it just go, right? A fellow student, that is, you know, uh, and that's how we started writing this novel to win. I want to make it clear. I wrote my first novel to win a thousand dollars. Not a thousand dollars, a thousand shillings, yeah. But once you started doing it, the novel took over. Huh? 
I can have described this in my memoir, uh, Bhagavad Dream Weaver. It's very important that the novel takes over. And one of the memoirs, that opening line, is a description of a visual I encountered once at Alliance High School. I went to a school called Alliance High School in Kenya. And once we went on a trip to another part of the country, Nyeri. Um, I think it was where Baden Powell is buried, you know, the English uh, founder of the Scout movement. He's buried in Nyeri. I think it's one of those occasions when people were coming all over the world to visit him, or to visit his grave or whatever. So we were part of, part of that. And I never gone beyond Nairobi. And when I passed pass Moranga, descending to Nyeri, oh my God, the lines were so beautiful. Even today, I remember it. Yeah, the way the hills and the valleys in you know, it together, I, it's a picture I shall never forget even today. And that was, was one of the lines that came about. I was describing a scene I had seen between uh, Moranga in Kenya. Just when you go past Nairobi, past Thika, then Moranga uh, before you, you go to Nyeri. Yeah. So the real landscape in Kenya, I was describing, yeah. Good, uh, thank you very much. So I'd like to take you to 1977, uh, which was, uh, which I think in um, your development and your evolution as a writer uh, is um, a seminal one. Uh, it was a year that your bracing and sparing novel, Petals of Blood came out. And that same year with uh, Gugi Wa Miri, is that how to pronounce the name? Yeah, the late Gugi okay. Miri. Okay, so you co-authored a play uh, entitled, whose English version was, uh, uh, I will marry when I want. And, yeah, yeah. Yes, so that play was staged um, in, uh, uh, in a public forum Mm -hmm. And you used the uh, local people, the peasants and workers and so on, as mm -hmm. the actors in that play. Right. Shortly after that production, in mm -hmm. Kikuyu, uh, you get arrested by the government. I think it was in December of 1977. And you will spend the next uh, one year, I think till December of 1978, before you are released. And it was in prison that uh, you began to write, uh, I, I believe your novel, Devil on the Cross. And you wrote it on toilet paper because yeah. you were not um, allowed to have uh, any writing material, any stationery and so on and so forth. Um, I want you to speak about the, uh, because I think in an interview, you have spoken about that moment, 1977, and your detention for writing in Gikuyu and staging this communal theater as a watershed. So I want you to describe for, for the audience today what that meant and how that radically uh, changed your trajectory as a writer. So first of all, let's say it was as momentous in some ways as, or more, but it's as momentous as my being uh, in Uganda uh, in 1959, my uh, seeing an African country for the first time, which had no white people. <laughs> it was a sensation. I sort of, I had grown up in Kenya, which is a white settler colony. Yeah. And I go to Uganda for the first time uh, in my life. And in a town, I'm just seeing black people with the occasional Indian people, but more like they were behind the shop, behind their counters, you know, in the shops and so, but otherwise in, in the streets, it was black people uh, without qualification, so to speak, right? 
and it was very, very moving for me uh, being in Uganda. And Uganda brought about all those uh, great things, my first play, my two novels, short stories. It was a glorious moment in my life in, in Uganda. But the key thing is I wrote all that in English. Okay, yeah. So years later, after going to Leeds and come back and start teaching at Nairobi University, you know, uh, in 1978, I believe, we decided to, we started asking ourselves, what is national theater, the whole question of theater and the people, yeah. So our idea was that theater comes from the people. What is national is that which is rooted among the people. So we went to this village, Kamerevi, which also happens my village, yeah. And started this, it's called Camredo Community Education and Cultural Center. And we go and marry, it was to do many things, you know, adult literacy and that kind of thing. But part of the activities was theater, okay? And that's why we wrote that play, I'll marry when I want, or Gahika Deda in Ikoyo. The thing is, if you are going to have theater in a community, are you going to ask that community to start learning English so that you can do theater with them or for them? As it is, it's we who became students because they knew their language better than we did and so on. And it was incredible, the empowerment of ordinary men and women, plantation workers, factory workers, the landless. It, it was like a revelation for me. And uh, it gave me into glimpses of what not only Kenya, but Africa could be, right? You could see it in the eyes of the people. You could see the confidence, the pride, and we need that pride. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in Africa, but the Kenya government all the time led by Jomo Kenyatta um, decided otherwise. Uh, I was a threat for whatever reason. And midnight, that the, front, the first of the play was stopped in November and then December, that one, armed police, blue cars, blue lights and red lights, you know, come to my house uh, in the village and they, they pick me up at midnight. And the following day, I find myself in a maximum security prison. Actually, the biggest prison in Kenya. <laughs> right, you know. So, let me just come to that moment. I, that's the moment I started asking myself very important questions to myself. What, why is it that nothing had happened to me except a few irritations here and there when I wrote Petals of Blood, very critical of the post-colonial regime, but in English. Or the play, The Trial of Dante Murphy, which I wrote with Michele Diamogo. Again, very critical in English. Why is it this one? <laughs> Not even as critical, really. <laughs> Written in a koyo, performed by peasants, workers, factory workers, plantation workers. Why stop it? who I put me in a maximum security prison for this. So my journey to understanding the politics of language really started there, you know. When, what, has, what historically has led us to a moment where an African government can imprison an African writer for writing a play in an African language? Yeah, that was, yeah, those are the kind of questions which went through me. In, and that's why, by the way, just um, because I've written about this in my memoir, 
wrestling with the devil. Uh, but that's why I decided to write uh, my first novel in uh, in Ikoyo. So it's another momentous thing because I'm writing it under prison conditions. I have no paper to write on. I have no pen to write on. It's whatever I can snatch or uh, from the world as whatever, right? Yeah, but it, it's like I'd seen, um, I don't want to put it in, in religious terms. It was like, uh, call it epiphany, call it a revelation or whatever you want to call it, yeah. But I saw the whole thing, what the language situation has done to Africa, yeah. The damage it has done to our continent, right? Because I went through history of colonization, then of course and afterwards, cumulatively. And cumulatively, this was eventually brought about my book, Decolonizing the Mind. And these days, wherever a colon, whatever people colonize another or impose their rule on another, in addition to military conquest, the first thing they do is disconnect the elite from their language, right? And make them English or French speakers. In a population that speaks African languages, <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to see what is happening. <laughs> that they are disconnecting the intelligentsia of a community <laughs> from the body of the people, all right? That's really what's happening, yeah. And the key thing is the English had talked about it. Let me give two or, two or three examples quite quickly. You can elaborate if you want to. It started in Ireland huh? because Ireland was Brit, uh, English first colony, settler colony, more or less. The uh, English people from London went to cover, took land, plantations in Ireland. But the Irish people were resisting all the time. They never quite accepted it, right? So the English were debating, how do they tame them? One of them, and this book you can read is there, my friends, is by Edmund Spencer. It's called A View of Ireland at the Present Time. It was published, I think, in 1596, and it's still available. And there are two characters, both English, are debating ways in which they can tame the Irish. What do they come up with? They come up with a naming system, disconnect them with their names, right? How they call a mark and O, disconnect that. Secondly, make them forget their, their language, English. And then they say, soon they will forget who they are. It's there in writing, uh, evidence there. Let's go to 1894 in India. Huh? Again, I think after the Indian probably. 1894, around the what you call Indian rebellion or mutiny or whatever. But anyway, the key thing, they want, how do they tame the Indian colonized? How do they do that? One guy called Macaulay came up with what is called Minutes on Indian Education, and which, by the way, you can Google. Can you please Google Minutes? on Indian education, please, after this. And he said this, we must establish English as the language of education in India, yeah? Because we want to create, create 
a class of Indians, Indian in the color of the skin, Indian in the, their manner of dress, yeah? Indian in the religion, but with the English minds. Okay. So let's take away the, let's take their mind, huh? but leave the body. <laughs> <laughs> you know, call the mind snatchers. <laughs> Let's snatch their minds eh? and leave this other body, you know. Right. And then he said, the reason we are doing this because these guys whose mind we have snatched will now become the buffer zone, they will help us govern this vast population. Right. So it's not as if they hid what they did. Let me just add one more. They did the same thing in America. Yeah. The enslaved Africans, their languages, African languages were banned on the slave plantation, right? In fact, some were hanged for speaking an African language in the Caribbean, right? But the settlers, white, Dutch, French, they were never linguistically disconnected from their European homeland, but Africans were disconnected. Or take Native Americans. They were treated the same way, break them through language. It happened to this among Maori people. And in all those places you find the same pattern. Humiliate kids when caught speaking African language in a school compound. Huh? I'm a donkey or I'm stupid or use feel. I mean, anything that makes a child associate his language with feel. After some time, this becomes internalized. Huh? The trauma is inherited, is passed on. The next generation will take this as norm, is normal to only express myself in English or French. It's normal to feel a little bit embarrassed about my mother tongue, or my mother tongue is not intellectual enough, right? That condition is nothing to do with language per se. It was colonial conditioning. And I'm sorry to say that we intellectuals from the continent have become one of the captives, you know, meaning in the same way Africans, African <laughs> skins, if you like, you know, uh, African hair and uh, you know, with an English minds, meaning English language minds, you know. Because imagine this, I write a novel in my career with no child about my experiences growing up in Kenya and again the background of Mau, Mau Mau fighting against the British. I'm very grateful to my mother who sent me to school. But in what language did I write my novel? How did I pay, put it this way, how did I pay back my mother for sending me to school? is by writing her story, my story, in a language she cannot possibly read or even be read for. And this has continued to the present. Now we were a generation and generation which has normalized this abnormality, right? The normalization of abnormality because, okay, there's nothing wrong, you know, what's, What's wrong in knowing and being rooted in your mother tongue and then adding English and French and other languages? What, what makes us think that we are only good in French only if we abandon our languages? <laughs> or we must demonstrate our knowledge of English by abandoning our languages. What about the other way around? You know your mother tongue you know whatever is a language that helps, uh, say, Nigerians to <coughs> communicate. And then you know other languages, add to it. But that's not what happens in a colonial situation. 
is like for the English language and other colonial languages to grow, African languages had to die. Right? That was the equation. Yeah. So, um, wow, thank you very much. This is, of course, a subject that you are deeply passionate about. And mm -hmm. um, I, I knew that we were going to uh, get into this uh, in depth. In 1986, in Decolonizing the Mind, this uh, series of essays, you lay out um, mm -hmm. the argument uh, that you have just uh, summarized. Uh, and then you made the... Um, uh, declaration that going forward, you are going to write all your books uh, exclusively in Gekuyu or Swahili, Kishwahili, and then have them translated uh, into other languages. Have you been um, disappointed that more African writers did not take the same, uh, did not go the same way that you that you went, did not, in other words, see the point, the argument that you have just laid out so eloquently? No, because I understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand why. Mm -hmm. It did come easily to me. I had thought about languages before, but there's a prison mm -hmm. that helped me cross there. Rubicon, so to speak, mm -hmm. the other way around. Mm -hmm. I understand, because how do I understand? Because I had been there, okay? So I don't say things from a holier than thou attitude. Mm -hmm. I saw, I was blessed to see, and I was able, thank God, to be able to put my beliefs uh, into practice, right? Or like demonstrating that it can be done, right? But I understand where people are coming from. As I said, in Africa, there has been normalization of abnormality. Hmm? Abnormality becomes the norm from which it's like building a house on sand, okay? So I understand. So it's been a conscious struggle. It cannot be, it's not a, it's a matter of which, oh, I want to do this. No, it be a conscious struggle. For, for instance, um, let me just be an advocate. For instance, if you write in an African language today, as I do, hmm, to get a publisher is a problem. Why? Because all African publishers are in the same mentality. They are competing with English publishers to publish in English, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Uh, uh, African governments are competing with European governments to develop English and French. <laughs> I mean, we put our resources African people, African government put taxpayers' money into English and French, competing with the European government in developing European languages. So I understand, but there's be a conscious struggle. Okay. Uh, why you were asking? African, I, I talked to African publishers the other day and I was asking the same question. What, is it, what makes you feel it's your duty to compete with English publishers in showing how you can bring about a, a more beautiful novel in English? <laughs> when your language is there, <laughs> really, your language is there, <laughs> nobody's helping along, <laughs> but you see that you're bound in duty <laughs> to go and start to sort of um, contribute to English and you're feeling very good about it, okay? Or French. But I said, I understand. Yeah. Uh, it would be a conscious struggle. African government could so easily lead the way 
if we had positive policies on African languages and if they put resources into those languages, okay? But they don't. We use African language for jokes. You want to have a nice joke or something to laugh at, you say it in your language. <laughs> It's really something to do with the vagarity. Okay, then people will say and laugh. <laughs> okay, but when you want to become serious, yeah. If you go to the United Nations, all heads of state, when they go to speak to the United Nations, they speak in their own language. <laughs> and it's translation. I know there are challenges in terms of what language one can use. Yeah, coming from a community or a nation of so many languages. But that's not why they don't do it. Because if we did that, we could develop African languages, make them communicate with each other. Then in that case, if you find there's a language that helps link them, that's okay. Right, but that's not what drives, it's like normality. You know, an African head of state will go, <laughs> like when they meet with an American, they say they want to prove that they can also speak English. <laughs> it's very funny sometimes. Yeah. So, so uh, this is really- uh... it's tragic, it's tragic, you know, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But let me put it on the positive side, on the positive side there are a few strengths now hmm, among some young writers, okay? Who are beginning to see, huh, who are putting some effort into connecting with their own languages. And I tell them this, and I like to pass this on to my listeners today, hmm, because it sums up everything. Huh? If you know all the languages of the world, and you don't know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that is enslavement. <laughs> yeah. But if you know your mother tongue or the language of your culture and add to it all the languages of the world, that is empowerment. Okay. So one is not saying, not really clear. I've never said there's something wrong with the European languages. It's the relations between those languages and our languages, right? Yeah, and we can change all that so that an African child in the continent can know, say, Yoruba or Hausa or Ibo and their mother tongue. Then, in my case, I like to propose Kiswahili as the language of the continent, and I can give reasons why. Kiswahili, for instance, or any other language. And then you can add to it European languages. That's empowerment there. But the other way around is really enslavement. Right. Imagine what could, uh, sorry, I tend to read my voice when I get like that. Imagine possibilities in African publishing. If I had a story, say, Kedamo Yuru, during the Koyo, now it's available in English. Huh? Suppose there was also a Yoruba publisher who did Yoruba translation. Ibo publisher who does an Ibo version, a Luganda publisher who takes a part. Then immediately we would turn our languages into an economic <laughs> power, <laughs> right? You, as a writer, I would never then ever need English or French because African languages themselves, you know, would be enough of a market for me, <laughs> for that way, right? And for everybody. So our languages is becoming like some kind of something become 
an advantage for many things, okay? So there are many to say about, but there has to be a conscious policy change by our government. And by change, I mean, they put resources into African languages in their own country. And it does not matter how many languages there are, it's okay. If there are 100 languages, it just means there are 100 peoples in that country who speak those different languages. And the challenge is how do you make those 100 communities also be able to communicate with each other? So, so Walimu, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to jump in because this is uh, a really fascinating uh, oh. conversation. And, and uh, I do know that you have a book, um, Something Torn and New, uh, mm -hmm. toward uh, the, an, African, an African Renaissance. Um, yeah. And you develop part of that argument, uh, part of this argument in that book. So my question is, um, again, to take the language question a bit. Yeah, yeah. good, yes, yeah. yeah. Something torn and new, an African uh, Renaissance. So could you sketch out uh, quickly for the audience um, how you see the connection between language and knowledge production in Africa? How, uh, say, African intellectuals properly understood can, in investigating their own language, uh, empower themselves to dig deeper in, into their cultural uh, patrimony and, and, and translate and transmit this to uh, both their indigenous audience as well as the audience um, of, of other readers. You know, okay, knowledge begins where we are. <laughs> I thought the word knowledge, even in English, comes from the word know. Okay. So the first thing you do quite is just know where you are. <laughs> right. You must know your house and the door to your house, right? And the path to your house, in and outside their house. It's your knowledge of your house that helps you to connect with other houses. Because you know the path from your house to other houses and the path back to your house, right? Knowledge begins with our bodies, you know, what I like to call the body of knowledge, right? All of us, the body is our teacher, by the way, you know, all the technologies in the world today are extensions of the body, right? You take the technology of motion, like cars and bicycles and airplanes and so on. They are only extending the power we already have in our legs. Okay, we can walk slowly, but you know, but technology helps us to do the same thing faster, right? So already we have it, right, in our body. Technology of seeing the telescope, eyeglasses, and so on. But already we have it now because we have two eyes that see. The rest is enhancing the power of that. And you can still see it with technology of hearing, you know. And now computer, the technologies of memory, call it technology of memory. Already our brains can do that. But technology, it enhances that. So we have that. So the first thing in knowledge system is knowledge of who you are. You start with who you are and then connect. From where I stand, I reach the stars. <laughs> Just like a language person studying London can also reach stars. I'm not saying he cannot reach the stars, right? From where we are, we connect. 
I was a Yoruba speaker. I wrote my son Yoruba, but then I connect to Igbo. Uh, I connect to English speakers through other means, through a common language or through translation or through any other means, right? But the first thing, the first order of knowledge is know yourself and your environment. In fact, when you are sending a child, you tell to know carefully, note where you are, eh? so they know how to come back, right? So, knowledge begins with that. And one of the problems is the colonization of the, I like to call it the cognitive process. We are told the knowledge of cities does not begin with, even from Lagos, it doesn't begin with Lagos. <laughs> it begins with my London. I know the streets of London or where this is, and you know, I know Oxford Street and other things. Huh? But if I'm asked about street in my <laughs> in say Lagos, I don't really know. Hmm? I don't think it's it's, it's knowledge, it's geographicness enough, hmm? or it's, it's not townish enough. Huh? The real town is and, and many other things like that, yeah. We can change, the, the problem is, I know we can change all that. I get frustrated because I know you're more powerful. You can root yourself in yourself, <laughs> right? Root yourself in yourself and you reach the stars, right? And I want to repeat, there's absolutely nothing wrong in mastery of English or French and so on. That's good. It means that you know French and you know your very well. It means, for instance, if you find a very good book in English, you can travel into Yoruba. <laughs> now you can use your knowledge of English eh, to help Yoruba, right? <laughs> or Igbo, okay? That's a different way, yeah. It's like giving another example which I normally give. You are at war with an enemy. And you generals. That side is generals, and your side is generals. Hmm? What happened to your army if your generals are captured by the, by the enemy? Eh? So think of the African intelligence community are the intellectual generals of the African people. <laughs> they become captives, <laughs> right? You know, it should be the other way around that they become like spies. They go into French language, into Mandarin, into uh, Spanish or whatever. The good books there, they look, they look, oh, they're a very good book. Get into Yoruba, <laughs> right? Or into Igbo, or, right? Wow. Let this me, is a scientific discovery. Let's, mm -hmm. let's see how it looks like in my mother tongue. Let, let me jump in again. And, and by the way, um, this is so fascinating that I'm conscious of time going and there are yeah, lots yeah. of people who have come in and who want to ask questions. Uh, so please, um, if you want to ask questions, uh, we'll get to you in another two or three minutes. But I wanted to um, I haven't even begun to scratch uh, the surface of the questions that I uh, wanted to, um, to pose to you, Walimu. But let me go to this one. You have distinguished yourself as a total artist, by which I mean that you have done extraordinary novels, you have done the memoir, you have done plays, you have done theory, you have done literary criticism, you've done essays, biography and the like. How do you, so, so two questions, uh, uh, maybe because I, I don't want to claim too much time. There are lots of people who are uh, waiting. So I'd like to maybe bunch the two questions into one. So the first is, I'd like to ask a question about your writing process, okay? But particularly, how do you determine uh, that one idea 
is amenable, is best treated as memoir, as opposed to fictionalized, uh, fictionalization, as opposed to, uh, say, a, a formal intellectual discourse like theory. How do you make that determination? And how do you write? Do you have some set time, some rituals uh, for your writing? Uh, well, that one is <laughs> different writers have different, uh, I like them to call them quirks. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. For instance, uh, yeah. if you come to my table, I won't show you my table, how it looks like <laughs> right now. <laughs> 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 Why won't you show? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story. Uh, once I was professor of literature at Nairobi University, uh, and um, for some, <laughs> for some reason, I I didn't really like putting my I I just like my name Guadiom. You know, uh, so I never actually put Professor Gogi in and with a little placard. If I remove it, later I would find it. It's been put back, <laughs> Professor. Then later some of the some of the <laughs> some of the workers, because they liked me uh, and so on, <laughs> they so they went to my office and decided <laughs> the professor office ought to be better looking. <laughs> So, so one morning I come to the office and I find all my papers have been <laughs> put in neat bundles, <laughs> clean. But oh my God, it took me a year to recover from that help. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because when you're writing and you, you, you come to my table and find all papers scattered, I roughly know where everything is. Yeah. yeah. But when you come, what you see is chaos, right? Uh, that, you know. <laughs> but other writers are different. They are writers who must clean up their table first and add things nicely. And they cannot, they cannot work in a cluttered space. And that's also fine. Yeah. You know, I write, every writer has their own, believe me, every writer has their own quirks. <laughs> right? Like if I start writing and I'm, well, even in my house, if I start writing a novel from one sitting on a particular chair <laughs> in a particular corner of the table, <laughs> I have a tendency of, just using that. And when, if I see somewhere else, the story doesn't come, but if I go there, <laughs> it helps the story move along. It's just a quirk. There are some who, writers who like to sharpen their pens or whatever it is very nice. They put them on the table very nicely. And that's also fine. There are some writers who like to write every 6 p.m. Uh, my son, uh, I, have a, I have three sons, uh, three, yeah three sons who are published authors and one girl, Wanji Kwagui. Uh, one of them, Dosho, I don't know, met Dosho. He's a New York based writer. Um, and he is the most disciplined <laughs> of us. You know, uh, he can, <laughs> I don't know how he does it, but I'm the exact opposite. I don't have, so everybody, every writer has to find their own niche so speak, you know, how they do things, you know. If it works for you, it's okay, yeah. Could you, could you speak to the other question of how do you decide um, oh, yeah. how that this, this material should be treated as fiction as well uh, as, as opposed to a different form? I don't really know about that, yeah, because the, I think the material dictates itself. Huh? So if I'm giving a talk, obviously, I have to think like a talk, huh? right? Or uh, like uh, I'm giving a lecture. Uh, its format begins to demand its own order. And so it's fiction. It demands its own order. If it's a play, the same thing. 
But it's not that I get an idea and I walk, I sit down and say, ah, this idea, hmm, how best should I treat it? A novel hmm? or a play? And you know, it does, for me, it does not work like that. They happen, yeah, for like all my plays were all occasioned by the demand or the time, right? So the play in Ikoyo, which we wrote, was, it arose for them, we are going to do theater in the village. So what play can we have in the village where the people speak Ikoyo only, right? So that dictated my writing in Ikoyo, initially in the play, okay? Yeah. Uh, but I like to explore, writers, all writers try to ex explore different forms Right? Yeah. Uh, he's like an artist visual who does, who can paint, he can do sculpture or line drawing. And so on. the same thing with the writer, you're experimenting with different um, uh, forms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't hear you. I can't hear you. Mute. Okay. You're okay. Mute. So, okay. I, I know. I know. So I don't know, uh, Wale, if you are there. Um, is Dr. Kedira there? Um, okay, because he was supposed to, uh, okay. Are you supposed to call in the questions that are coming from Walimu? Yes, I can do that. Okay, all right. So are you ready or should I ask him another question? Okay, after your question, then I will okay. So, so Walimu, um, the, the question that I, I, I like to ask um, as, as uh, Dr. Kedira gets ready to uh, bring some of the questions that people have been posting on the chat is how much of the writing by uh, African writers, especially the younger ones, do you, uh, do you keep in, in uh, um, have you been following? And if you have, what do you see uh, about the trends in, uh, in writing by, by younger African writers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I've not really been able to keep up uh, in a sense, like the way, you know, at the beginning, uh, in the 60s, uh, we used to keep up with everybody that came from the continent. <laughs> it was wonderful. Uh, but now there are so many young writers in Kenya, Africa, all over, and it's wonderful. The one thing I still have this problem with language things, so I keep on coming back to this. Juan, our young warriors, why not become a warrior for your mother tongue? And this doesn't mean I want to repeat. You don't learn others. Yes, you add to the to your mother tongue. So I like to see more uh, African writers, and there are some young writers who are beginning to do that. By the way, yeah. I think there's one Yoruba uh, caller. I think is she's a great warrior for Yoruba language. Yeah, um, there's a Munyao uh, Kilolo in Kenya who led the translation of my short story, uh, The Upright Revolution, written in Ikoi originally, and now is into 100 uh, languages um, uh, of the world. Most of them, about 50 or more of them, are African. So the case of a, a story uh, written originally in Ikoi, being available in 50 other African languages. Yeah. And that's done by a young person, right? You know, there is a, a lady in Kenya called Jane Obuchi, mm -hmm. Obuchi, who has started a publishing house and she's published Ekegusi translation of Romeo and Juliet in Ekegusi. She's just published things fall apart in Ekegusi. 
she's doing one of my books. I she's also, she's also translating our marijuana wand, Kahikadeda, into Ekegusi. This is really a breakthrough, right? And this is a young lady who is doing this, right? And she tells me that it's doing very well <laughs> in Ekegusi. So Ekegusi may soon turn out to be the first intellectually real <laughs> vigorous language, you know, uh, in, a, in a sense, being by having an intellectual who is feeding it uh, with the new material. Because as I said at the beginning, remember, there's nothing wrong in getting the best in the world available in our languages. It would be great. Hmm? So, Anmata, I like Shakespeare. I like to see Shakespeare in African languages. I like Tolstoy, the Russian writer. I like to like see Tolstoy in African languages. Hmm? <coughs> I like the Indian epic Mahabharata. I like to see that in African languages, for instance. You know, yeah. So what I would like to see there is the young people see themselves as intellectual warriors. The battle is not easy right now, but it will change with young people taking up their battle cry. Good. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's one question that somebody has posted. He said, you speak passionately. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. So um, uh, it's uh, from Abdul Mogale. He says, you speak passionately of writing in African languages. What is your comment about people who urge us not to write about our past? That is our tribulation, the tribulations of our past under apartheid in South Africa, but rather to write positive stories. So that mm -hmm. entreaty to write positive stories, how would you respond to that? Positive stories come from facing that past, okay? We learn from the bravery of our ancestors. Yeah? We learn from those who took up arms against apartheid, those who believed. Yeah? Yeah? You, you, in this book, uh, Southern Torn and New, I've written a lot about South African intellectuals. They were among the first in the 1930s and 40s to debate the question of African languages. And I've given full credit in this book, okay? They debated the issue of African languages very, very passionately, okay? And there are others like Diop from Senegal, again, very passionate uh, believer in um, uh, African languages. Positivity comes from looking at what we have, looking at our past, at our struggles, and so on. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Avoiding them. And there's no such a thing as a positive story which did not arise from the reality of what you've been doing. Yeah? It's like, there are, no, there are no tears. There are no, there's no laughter really without tears. You never know what laughter is unless you know tears, <laughs> right? Yeah. You never know what ha as laughter and happiness is unless you experience sadness. Because how do you compare, oh. <laughs> right? So sadness, part of us, right? Our struggles are so important to us African people. Yeah, and we have to give tribute to the only man and woman of Africa for who they did for us. Um, okay, I don't know if uh, uh, Wale, you're ready, um, but if you're not, I can ask more questions of, uh, are you ready? I go ahead, uh, okay. I'm okay, <laughs> so, 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 so let, me, let me ask you, uh, Mualimu, um, what are you writing uh, now? What, what would you, what, what's, what's on, your, on your schedule for your next project? No, I really wanted to do another. <laughs> Reading? This is huh? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, I was surprised 
at this journal because I never, I, I don't know why I never thought I could write a verse. Eh? My son Mokoma was a poet in the family, right? <laughs> He's the one who wrote the verse and, uh, and uh, you know, I never thought I could do that, you know. So when this happened to me, I was so very excited that I could do it in verse, really. Uh, it's like a gift to me, to myself, yeah. Now, problem number one, <laughs> don't laugh at me. <laughs> I want to do another epic, <laughs> but nothing comes. <laughs> I try, I try to, I don't know, oh, do this. I nothing, yeah. So for me, writing has always been a struggle, by the way. Yeah. I struggle. I struggle. Yeah. To find new themes. Uh, yeah. And my books, I don't, we don't have the time now, but my books have come out of various experiences. Uh, and then the soul takes flight soars and then, oh my god that's wonderful yeah. yeah we we look at a novel like uh, uh wizard of the crow which is uh, again a departure a kind of rupture in in your career as a writer and you have had so many of such uh departures if you like um could you tell the story of the gestation of that story that novel and its development how did how did you wrestle with it because it's it's a, a different kind of style it's a new voice you are deploying uh, a lot of comedy in in writing uh, your critique of this uh, terrible dictatorship and so on so how how did that the elements of that story come together for you yeah. i'll tell you a secret all of Please. you <laughs> 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 you can keep a secret. <laughs> uh, you know, after I published Matigari, it took me a long time to come up with another idea of a novel, and I really wanted to write a novel, and I could not find anything. Yeah. Matigari is a novel which was whose main character, the Moy government in Kenya, tried to arrest, and so on. You know. But I'll tell you, this, this is a bit personal, but I have to say it because I think it would be useful to other people as well. Uh, in 19, 1997 or 1996, uh, we, my wife and I went for, to see the heart doctor, you know, in New Jersey. Me, I don't know what I was suffering from, maybe a cold or something, you know. Huh? But she told him, go check everything. Anyway, in Africa, we don't go to a doctor, say, check me, <laughs> unless you are ill. I mean, don't go, I mean, so, I'm, oh, I must see a doctor to do what? So he can check me, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so the doctor, of course, did whatever, you know. And then after some time, he came back. His face was long. I had prostate cancer. My PSA, which measures uh, uh, prostate cancer, was extremely aggressive. And he, the daughter, thought it had gone to my backbone or leave notes, I don't know what they call them, yeah. And if the cancer touches your bones, you are gone. Huh? You cannot, it cannot be removed, it cannot be taken out and so on, you know. So, uh, so the doctor, I remember, he gave me three months to live, okay. Uh, I, I mean, it's a big blow because with prostate cancer, you don't feel, <laughs> there's no pain, by the way, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I mean, so you may carry it with you quite happily, 
and you know, and then one day you fall, and people might say you have been uh, not what we have been bewitched <laughs> because just yes, for you are held one day and then ooh, yeah, yeah. So it was quite a blow. I don't know how to put it. Anyway, all I know, you know, uh, okay, that that night I went back to New Jersey, sat on my desk, and wrote the first line of Wizard of the Crow in Ikoyo. It was, and I'm grateful about it though, it was going to be my farewell novel. Huh? And I wanted to finish it within three months. So I was writing furiously, but it refused to be finished. It took me six years <laughs> to do the novel, right? Yeah. Uh, fortunately, uh, for my post cancer, I was given tablets, something, but they could not remove it. So I still carry it to, to, to this day, but it's been stabilized by uh, uh, medic, but it cannot be removed. And I'm telling this because of all the young men who are listening to me, please. African people and black people are prone to prostate cancer. So please, you want to get yourself checked at least once every year. And they check what is called PSA. If your prostate cancer is caught in time, you are okay, right? Otherwise it might be too late. You see a young person, he's 40, 50, and he falls on the wayside, people might think he's bewitched or something like that. It happened a lot to African people, to black people, right? So I imagine all the young people who are hearing me, wherever you are, uh, by the young people, I mean the you know, 40s, 50s, they are kind of, after 40 years, I think you should get yourself your PSA checked. If you caught in time, you'll be okay. All right? Yeah. Okay. Walimu, well, um, there are two questions from, um, um, from listeners which I'd like to uh Mm -hmm. to you or maybe even three so mm -hmm. one is from a dear friend of mine Rudolf Okonkwo and he says Joroge went to school and then what what did he accomplish is Africa better today because Joroge went to school <laughs> then two he said you propose that Swahili should be the language of the African continent mm -hmm. if ethnic tensions are increasing in Kenya where mm -hmm. um, you know people speak Swahili what are the advantages that are there for adopting a common language across Africa? So that's one. I'd like you to, uh, if you can, uh, put it down quickly. I want to pose uh, two other questions. Okay, let me quite quickly see this. Tensions uh, okay. in Africa are not there because of languages. <laughs> good, good. So, so, but, so yeah. Jorogio going to school. And then what? Did he accomplish yeah. anything? What no, did I'm he yet, accomplish? This question of the ethnic language. Uh, okay. uh, people, Tensions are not there because of their languages, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, other, it's corruption. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are producing oil, uh, mm -hmm. yes. and there's corruption. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no, that create, this is what create tensions, you know. Uh, the yes. elite one community want, you may be corrupt, but they may want to point at others mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, mutual mm -hmm. pointing out, you know. Uh, what we want in Africa, is the empowerment of ordinary man and woman. Yes. Economic empowerment, mm -hmm. political empowerment, cultural empowerment, psychological empowerment. So let me, let me pose another question because there are quite a few and maybe we'll take three or four. I yeah, know I'll you've been very, I know you've been very generous I'll with your time. i check my answer. Okay, how about that? Yeah. Yes. So, so um, Dancing Kayana wrote, uh, language changes with time. How, ha how have you kept in touch with developments in Gikuyu long after you've been transplanted from the Gikuyu speaking community? Yeah. Um, if, you, if you hold that uh, answer, I'll 
ask another question from a different person. Let me just answer very quickly. Okay, you know, please. Right, it's very, a writer needs to be where the language is being used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's very hard for me to be very frank. You know? mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. I'm not in touch with the latest development in the Yiko language. Yes. Uh, so Which was you want to go to a marketplace, you catch the new phrases, mm -hmm. all things like that, you know. So through the radio or television, I can follow, but really it's mm. a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it, it's 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 uh, one of the questions that I wanted to pose uh, that you've spent after your uh, detention, you spent uh, most of uh, that time uh, after you were released outside of Kenya and therefore of your immediate culture, and I think you make occasional forays. And there was a long period of uh, almost two decades when you didn't go home at all. Uh, so I wanted to know how that affects you and your, your creative inspiration and so on and so oh. forth. But let me, let, me go to, um, let me go to one more question because I want so many people uh, okay. ask right. questions. Uh, somebody said, um, wrote here, um, um, uh, let's see, so many questions. Um, do you think that literary awards, especially African-based writing competitions have played a role in the development of literature in Africa? Of, of course, I've given my example, I wrote the river between for a prize, eh? mm -hmm. but note one thing. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Prices are given to African writers on condition that they do not write in an African language. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of a competition where you submit your novel in Igbo and they accept it for the competition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. So prices are given so, so far to detach Africans from their languages, mm -hmm. it's enticement. Yes. <laughs> you write yes. in English, mm -hmm. you get these awards. Mm -hmm. You write in Igbo, nothing. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. So Which... we have to cheat the other way around. Is mm -hmm. is the, the key things? We Africa is the largest continent in the world. Mm -hmm. Ninety percent of the resources of the continent go to Europe and the West. Mm -hmm. Africa is the biggest donor to the West. It has been there like that for centuries. Ooh. And so it's so pathetic. It's just sad to see it. We give all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go for a little bit of aid to that which, and we are giving a bit of that which we have already given. Mm -hmm. We give them 10%, they mm -hmm. give us back 1%. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be very grateful mm. for that. Right? Yeah. Wow. Remember, so, so, remember, remember for you, Nigerian oil, I'm told, I'm, mm -hmm. told I'm not an, an oilist, but mm -hmm. I'm told that Nigerian oil for is the purest enough in the world, or one of the mm -hmm. purest oils. Eh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So le le let me, uh, somebody wrote uh, three quick questions. One is, what inspired you to embrace Marxism? Uh, the other one is, do you think that the culture of fear and silence is still potent in Africa, and why so? Um, yeah. As a third one, magic realism as a decoy of revolutionary aesthetics in the late fictions of Ngugi Wa Thiango. Mm -hmm. How true is this, especially in your latest work? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, yeah. I so your embrace of Marxism and yeah. then fear and silence as potent forces in Africa, do they still exist, do you think? The one who dubs it magic realism, actually, is my daughter, Magic eh? Wang. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And I think she's now coming out in October called Seasons, Seasons in Hippo Land. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so ask the question again. Yeah. Um, okay. The, 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 um, the first question is what inspired you to embrace Marxism? Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Well, in my, I mean, it's a long story, but uh, Marxism is the only person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maximum the worker in your mm -hmm. village or the peasant in your village, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about knowing the conditions under which you live and work from there, you know. You're going to empower Nigeria or Kenya or, or mm -hmm. Uganda 
mm -hmm. where does empowerment come from? Mm -hmm. From ordinary man. Mm -hmm. and woman. Yeah. Yes. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, people who should remember Marx himself said he was not a Marxist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, so the other the other question is about fear and silence. Um, whether yeah. they, yeah, I think that that element is still there. Though, like in Kenya, there is I can say I think this one I can say fairly confidently. Mm -hmm. The kind of fear and silencing mm -hmm. that used to be there that drove me to prison mm -hmm. and to exile. Mm -hmm. I think that one is really not there. Mm -hmm. I've seen people in Kenya mm -hmm. talking about things for which in my time they, people were killed by the government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now they can say it. So mm -hmm. in that sense, there's an improvement, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we should, not, we should never be afraid of contest of ideas. Nobody has a mono, even Google Audio has no monopoly of Ooh. good ideas, you know. Uh, they must yeah. be debated and so on. So mm -hmm. their merit is found or not, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. But you can't say my ideas or nothing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is what it was with some of the dictatorships in uh, mm -hmm. Africa. I'm sure the elements of that, but so far I think it's been an improvement. But the price of something is eternal vigilance. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> the right. But it is eternal vigilance. vigilance. Let, let me... not, anyway, mm -hmm. it will not be democracy. You know, until we think of democracy in terms of empowerment mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. ordinary man and woman of Africa. Mm -hmm. That's where our power comes from. Yeah. Sure. So there's a question. Um, a reader says that the grain of wheat is easily his favorite or her favorite of your novels. Uh, mm -hmm. And they said, what do you look at as your best, Prof. Sangugi? Uh, uh, sorry. Is, oh, is, can you ask again? <laughs> the, the, the question is, uh, this reader says that The Grain of Wheat is, uh, is their favorite novel uh, uh -huh. of your novels and said, what, what is your favorite of your own novels, uh -huh. of your own books? First of all, first of all I can say, there just was a, a question on the chat, huh? mm -hmm. <laughs> which mm -hmm. I found very interesting. Yeah. Yes, okay. That, this is a question, Professor, is there the continuation of things fall apart. I know, I saw it. <laughs> we wish it would have an epilogue. Yes. So I want yes. to tell you a story. Mokoma yes. and my son and I, once in Nairobi, mm -hmm. and somebody, airport, we're going to Kenya together, mm -hmm. and somebody from a professor, who told me, was a professor from Zambia, or person, mm -hmm. saw me and came towards me and said, oh my God, you are, huh? You are Chino Achebe. I love your novel. Things fall apart so much. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. I'm not Chino Achebe. Chino Achebe. And I pointed at Mokoma. This is Chino Achebe. So <laughs> the professor went to <laughs> Mr. Achebe. <laughs> In other words, the professor could not even see that Mokoma was Obviously, considerably younger than me. He's my yeah. son after all. Yeah? Yeah. So, come up, played along. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, so, my God. So, Mokoma became a chair before I. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, so let, let me, let me, um, uh let me so we're going to do if you don't mind we're going to do nine more minutes uh and 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 end you've been very very generous with your time somebody wrote what are the elements in your view of an african story what are the elements of an african story um for me always it has to do with the uh, exploration of african realities yeah mm -hmm. yeah and that's why i come back to the question of of language, yeah? mm -hmm. I was very, you know, when I wrote Kedamo Yuru, I don't have to describe it. It's about um, really this, the perfect night is really about empowerment of women. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. Yeah, because the women here grew up without brothers. So they had to do everything themselves. 
Ooh. They knew how to build. I mean, obviously, I mean, logically, if they're no brothers, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then they had to do everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They knew how to hunt, how to make mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. how to make weapons, how to use weapons. They knew how to use their mind, uh, heart, and hands, right? And yeah, so for me, this is one of my best in terms of just feeling that I have, I don't know how to put it, it's very empower. I come back to this word empowerment, you know? And for me, by the way, the empowerment of Africa must begin also with empowerment of the African woman. Ooh. Very important. We are not going to make headway anywhere without recognition of the role of women in our history, in our very make up as a people. For one thing, as I see in Perfect Nine, the, 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 my, so they, they tell the girls, you know, that they know to always remember and the man that a woman, no, no, every human being, male or female, there was a woman who carried him or her for nine. Mm -hmm. No, there's nobody who has ever come from a man, I mean, in a Tamil, <laughs> right? Mm. So that alone, you know what I want to say, that empowerment is so very important. I cannot overstate uh, the importance. And by woman, of course, I always mean the ordinary man, a woman of Africa. Good. Very important, yeah. Yeah, let me, there is, there is, um... Uh, oh my gosh, questions keep rolling in. Uh, so maybe sometime next year or sometime in a month or two, we'll do another section with you. Uh, somebody just said that you are claim that prizes are not given to African writers for, uh, for writing in African languages, but only for writing in, in European languages. Sounds like a conspiracy theory. And was asking if there are other possible explanations. But before you get to that, if you choose to, there is actually a question that I think that you must confront and let me read it to you. Um, somebody wrote, if the beauty of the world, but particularly the continent, lies in its multiplicity, multiplicity of centers, mm -hmm. doesn't privileging even one of its own centers, especially given the fact that it is a mixture, and I think that the person is talking about Kiswa Healy, it is a mixture uh, that it is a mixture with a little Arabic, which is still foreign, lead to exactly the same place European languages have led us. In Kenya and Tanzania, for instance, it's becoming evident that where their uh, Ugandan counterparts are kept away from their mother tongues by English, the young people now are kept away from their mother tongues by Kishwahili. So could you uh, respond to that and uh, perhaps to the question about uh, the... Uh, Conspiracy theory. Very quickly, conspiracy theory. I don't know, all I know is that's a reality. Mm. Because I know, I did, was in Tanzania was a place where I found it very interesting, you know, organizing a competition to, to, to help African literature. Huh? But they could not write in an African language. It's like going to France and say, I'm going to promote French writers, but they must write in Chinese, right? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm for them be accepted, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, can, can you say the other question? Try, okay, uh, so, so the other question is basically somebody oh, is saying yes. about different centers and how if you yeah. that get the, that the question. Is, yeah. mm -hmm. The question, if you look at colonial uh, uh, arts was languages, they governed by hierarchy, mm -hmm. hierarchy that English and if you are inherently higher than, huh? and not only this is higher than, they go one step and suppress other languages. It's as if European languages can only grow on the graveyard of other languages. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. If we adopt hierarchy, 
ya se este mujer es Kiswahili, o Ikuyu, o Ibo, entonces Yoruba es un inherente higher than Ibo, of course, we are selling the same hierarchy, <laughs> right? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Languages can and should really, and always have related on base of, as a network mm. of equal give and take. Ooh. My policy, which I recommend for Africa, is this. Every African child to be rooted in their mother tongue, even if that language is spoken by only five people. Uh, then, wait, 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 then, then every African in my new policy should have Kiswahili, okay? Not as a higher, <laughs> not as someone is inherently higher than any other, okay? Kiswahili. And uh, then English, French, or whatever, a number of other languages you can add. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying Kiswahili only, I'm saying uh, mother tongue, if you're Yoruba, be rooted in Yoruba, okay? Mm -hmm. Then in that case, knowing Kiswahili that enables you to communicate with somebody from, say, East Africa, eh? mm -hmm. then add to that English or French and so on, you know. Um, now, let me let me connect my computer to my to power source. Is it, Please. Eh? OK. Yeah. All I can say is that this is impressive. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Well Thank okay. you. Well, that's. Uh, we have. Uh, I'm uh, thank you for, only for organizing this, and I hope that. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, and Wale is going to be speaking I mean, in another yeah. in another two minutes or something. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to round it up. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, I wasn't able to, as I was talking to him, see what the question, how the questions were coming into the chat. So I'm sorry for those who asked extremely great questions that I wouldn't be able to get to. Um, but Ngugi has been also extremely generous. We told him uh, initially a minute and a half, I mean, an hour and a half, and we're inching toward two hours. So um, at, at his age, that's a great generosity um but please forgive me personally because i wanted to get more and more of you uh, uh, into the conversation but some time does not move when you have a great story <laughs> 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 yes so so thank you for your patience and your forgiveness All right. mm -hmm. Okay. So, so okay. Walimu, Walimu, so, can, yes, can, yes, okay. We want to think network of equal give and take. We say no to hierarchy. Whether it's Kiswahili or Yoruba or Ikuyu. But network of equal give and take. And if I said there is a language which enables the different language communities also additionally communicate with each other, then that's good. And that language should be an African language. Mm -hmm. Kiswahili uh, has, of course, had Arabic words, but so has English. <laughs> mm. English have borrowed from all the languages of the world, mm. including Kiswahili, words like safari, <laughs> mm -hmm. or French words. All languages borrow from each other. Mm but they make those words part of the language. They are, they mm -hmm. are digested by the language, so speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes. there's nothing wrong in a language getting words from other languages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. um, so um, this is my last question um, because uh, I need to yield the floor to uh, uh, Dr. Kedira to give a vote of thanks. Um, so somebody, um, uh, has asked, um, how do you want to be remembered when you're no longer here? And 
and I, I hate the morbidity of this question, where would you want your remains to rest uh, for eternity in America or in Kenya? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but somebody else, uh, and it says, it's um, a very mischievous friend of mine who asked that question, but somebody else has proposed uh, mm -hmm. that you are long overdue for the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And I know that in an interview, you said that what's even more important for you is the Nobel of the heart. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we have given you so many Nobels mm -hmm. of the heart because you are an essential mm -hmm. writer for me and mm -hmm. for so many of my fellows and for so many writers, not only of African origin, but indeed uh, so many writers around the world. You have trained so many people, you've educated so many of us and continue to do it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, speak a little bit about the great work that you do, that you did with your children. I've told you several times that you are the luckiest African writer. Mm -hmm. uh, several of your children uh, followed in your footsteps and you adopted me as one of your children. So that even increased the number of us um, who are following. But I know that you also are, are bringing up your own grandchildren and their friends um, by encouraging them to be excited about, about literature. So it's, it's not really a question. Um, you know, so somebody has spoken about the Nobel Prize. I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking about how you've inspired and continue to inspire uh, future generations, yeah. including the generations of your grandchildren. So use this as a closing statement, if you like. Okay, because, uh, okay, Dibe is referring to, I have what I call the grand performance. Huh? Yes. My grand performance is grandfather to my grandchildren. Huh? Mm -hmm. Every two weeks, like tomorrow, we are going to have an session. Huh? And okay, Dibe has been one of our guests storytellers, okay, yeah. So if anybody would like to tell my grandkids a story, <laughs> please volunteer. Last week, two weeks ago, we had Angela Davis came over and well, on Zoom, of course, and told them a story, yeah. So we really enjoyed this grand, we got the grand performance, grand, from grandfather, grandchildren, yeah. Now, my children, including you, uh, okay, Dibe, <coughs> I commend them for what they are doing, uh, the writing, the books, and so on, but they have not obeyed me in this one respect. Eh? Our languages, they still continue to kind of, oh, hear me? Why not? Eh? Oh, yeah. Eh? You, okay, we have said you're going to write me a story in Igbo. Hmm? Yeah. Right? So you still owe me a story in Igbo, okay? Because you must lead the way. Okay? I will keep that promise. I'll keep yeah. that promise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not, I don't say that they must, but I would like to see a, a day when they come and they are also writing in uh, African languages. Yeah. Which, which is the question? I'll answer very quickly. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. The question is what you would like to be remembered uh, oh, for when you're no longer, and whether yeah. where your remains should rest for well, the rest of eternity. Well, morbid, right. morbid question. No, no, I have no intention. Just <laughs> 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 now, I have no intention of leaving this up. <laughs> 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 it's a beautiful art. Uh, to cling to it, uh, and um, yeah, and uh, hopefully, when uh, uh, if I, if anything, I like to become part of the soil of Africa. Mm. You, know, you know, because your father and I, you know, if you don't realize that the air we breathe is part of us, the soil is part of us. Yeah. For instance, quite quickly, can you imagine that we have no earth on which to walk? Mm, mm. <laughs> uh, we'll fly you, interminably. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine that if you have, don't have one arm, you can still live. Mm. But if you cannot breathe air, air, you can live for a day. Huh? Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So the air is more part of me than even my arm. Okay. Mm. 
So we are part of this earth. Yeah. And that's why among the co and two body, they also throw some soil into the uh, mm -hmm. burial ground mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all writers really come to me this. Uh, what they leave behind in some ways, say like Chinua Achebe, mm -hmm. and things fall apart. Mm -hmm. Whoever forgets Achebe today? Mm. Everywhere in the continent. Yeah. Mm. They talk about Chinua Achebe, almost as if he's, for them, he's very much alive, okay? Mm. And so it's true of all writers, you know, when I hope I can write something that can be Reminder, not only remember that can make a difference to Ooh. whoever shall read it, the Ooh. children of tomorrow. Yeah. I like to see a young girl, you know, in any part of Africa reading Kedamu Yuru or the path of mine and say, I'm going a warrior of the mind, a warrior of the body, a warrior of the heart, just like those women. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That's really how I hope, uh, uh, yeah, I can leave, if I can leave something, if you can inspire the children of tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure I'll be very happy, <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. I may mm -hmm. be tomorrow, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Walimu. Um, I'll now turn it over and thank you, by the way, to all of you who have uh, tuned in from different parts of the world uh, to be part of this great conversation. Again, I'll apologize for seeming to have um, dominated uh, the uh, posing of questions to the Green Walimu. Um, mm -hmm. For a while, this technology is new to me, so I couldn't figure out how to get to the questions. So I'm really, really sorry. I, I will do better next time. Uh, Rudolph Okonkwo, you must forgive me as well. Okay, so I'm turning it over to you, uh, Wale. Where is, where is Wale? Uh, did, did we lose him? Um, what happened to Wale? He was supposed to be part of the yeah. huh? <laughs> Are you see me? <laughs> I'm saying Wale was supposed to be part of this conversation. Yeah. We, yeah. can, we cannot see you. No, we're not seeing you, but we can hear you. But so go on, go ahead and talk. And if you're having technical difficulties, I'll... I'll... Okay. Maybe, uh, Walimu, why don't you... Um, why don't okay. you mute? Yes. Who, who me? Yes, you and, and everybody should mute, yes. Okay, can you see me now? Hello, okay. And we cannot see you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. I, I, I can see you, Wally. I can see you. Oh, you can? Okay. Okay, maybe you're can, off can my... You uh, um, okay. well, can you hear me? Oh, okay, I can, I can see you now. Yes, please go on. We can okay. hear you. Okay. I'm yes. Glad. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a very wonderful occasion. And, uh, you know, it took us about almost a year to track down Professor Wathiongo. And uh, I think it's worth the wait. Uh, we use a lot of uh, people to get him. And I think uh, between OK and Barbara, we finally succeeded. So we want to thank uh, OK and uh, Barbara for helping us to uh, get uh, Professor Ationgo. And uh, also to thank uh, the prof himself for such an uh, lucid and very interesting encounter. We were worried that uh, keeping you for two hours would be too much, but it's like you still want us to continue with you. But uh, as a doctor myself, I think, uh, I know that we shouldn't over, overdo it. And uh, I want to thank uh, all our members of power from various countries who, who came around 
for this occasion. Um, I don't want to go down, make all the, I don't, I don't want to name names. Uh, I can see so many of our distinguished members, Professor Femi Osofi Son, uh, Akachi Ezebo, and so many of them from uh, Uganda, from Kenya, uh, from the US, and uh, from all over Africa. I also want to thank my staff who are working in the background, the project officer, uh, the, technic the technical experts. Uh, I want to thank all of them. Uh, like I said earlier on, uh, we are having this series so that we can learn from our elders, the veterans. And uh, we also want to use it as an occasion for them to uh, also engage with the younger writers to keep them up and going. And like uh, Professor Wathiongo mentioned, uh, to also get used to this uh, technology of the new era. And uh, the next uh, veteran writer is going to be another big one. I uh, will let, we'll let you know who it is. Uh, so at this point, uh, then the, all the questions, we're going to package the remaining questions and send to uh, Professor Wathiongo. I will do that uh, maybe by email so that you can help us answer some of the questions. They are very, very important ones. But we don't want to overtax him. He has done so much. And uh, thank you, sir. We wish you a wonderful, well, it's evening here in Ghana. I'm sure you are still, you are still young in your own part of uh, the world. But I wish you a wonderful weekend. And uh, thank you, okay? We'll do this again. Mm. <laughs> I don't forget the, the Ibo, the Ibo uh, literature my that- uh, My promise. Uh, yes, right. I, I promised, uh, I promised Mualimu that I will write something, maybe a short story in Ibo, and I, uh, to, as a beginning, and I fully, because he's inspired me really by his example, and um, I fully intend uh, to keep that promise. So Mualimu, I'm publicly renewing my promise which I made in private to you. And thank you very much again for what you've done, what you continue to do, and for being such an inspiring figure, both uh, in literature and also in the moral world. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Night, everyone. Good night. Good night. with you. Yeah. Professor at Professor Kachi Zeibu, I'm glad to be with all of you. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. From Norway. I, I can't, be, I can't then, believe I could you. be associating with all of you at the same time. <laughs> okay. What a beautiful evening to have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Thank Mogali you. from South Africa, thanks for coming, all yes. of you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks a lot from calling from Norway. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The last, yeah. yeah. The last time I met you was way. calling from Ghana. Was Ghana. Thank you. Yes. 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 yes, 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 yes. yes. from Ghana. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. From Ghana. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you for coming. Oh, you? Greetings from Ghana. Welcome. Bye. 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 Hello from Rwanda. Oh, beautiful, Bro, beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Kigali here, yeah. Kigali. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very thank much you. from Taraba State, Nigeria. Thank you. Good, good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Ndibenye. Okay, Ndibenye. Yes. Oh <laughs> no. Uh.